Dave Longman here from Headforms. And Dave is a product owner, a scrum master with eight years experience building agile teams. Company works for Head Forwards, leading agile teams split between Cornwall and Kent. Previously, he's worked for IDBS in Surrey, managing technical teams and leading agile transformation of the product delivery organisation. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? It was, yes. <laughs> I did, yeah, oh. but, but now but now I hear it out loud, I'm questioning why I wrote it like that. <laughs> All right, cool, thank you very much for coming. Um, just a bit of logistics to start with. Um, can you put your hand up if you're a developer? Okay, cool. What about if you're a tester? Okay, cool. So, can we move all of the testers over to that side? Hey, Jacob. So I'm going to talk about testing today. Um, so software delivery is changing. Um, actually, I think software delivery has already changed from um, a few years ago. We're starting to release more often. So this is a chart from the latest State of DevOps report. Um, it splits uh, the people who've responded into high-performing companies and lower-performing companies based on their uh, level of DevOpsness, uh, and the top performers are these orange people, and you can see that these top people are, are deploying 1,600 or so times a year. That's, that's a lot of times that they're releasing, so there's a lot of releasing going on. It's not just releasing, though. We've also got our code bases are getting bigger. So this is some pretty old data, but it's pretty hard to find data about a number of lines of code in a, in a code base. So this is from Photoshop. Um, when Photoshop first came out, version 1 in 1990, it had about 128,000 lines of code. Uh, in 2012, when they released CS6, that had grown to 4.5 million lines of code. So there's a lot more functionality in, in applications. There's a lot more complexity in the code base. Uh, even if our development and testing practices get better, I suspect that there's more chance of bugs being found in 4.5 million lines of code than there are in 128,000 lines of code. So our code is getting more complicated. Um, our teams are also changing. If you look back at what teams looked like in kind of the 2000s, we tended to have project teams that were um, formed from kind of departments of speciality. So you'd have your <laughs> development department, you'd have your testing department, you'd have um, a database team, um, and you would build a development a project team from people in, those, in, in each of those organisations. So we're very siloed. Now more and more teams are, or more and more companies are starting to build up product teams. So agile teams that have got uh, a varied collection of different uh, specialities within the team so the team can deliver everything they need to um, on their own. So there's a lot of changes to kind of what we're delivering, but there's also more testing. We're just There's more stuff to test. So I've got a list of a few things that we test. Um, it's not the final, it's not a full list. Uh, if we drill into a few of them, so device testing. Now more and more people are expecting that they can use their, uh, their, their piece of software they have in the office, not only on their office computer, but on their work phone or from their tablet when they get home. So from a testing point of view, we're starting to have to test more and more of these devices. APIs, a, a few years ago, an API in an application was really just a kind of technical detail for how the application worked. It wasn't like a product in its own right. Now we're starting to find more companies, uh, more applications are trying to kind of create mashups between different applications and integrate different systems together. So the APIs for these applications become a product in their own right. And so we need to start looking at testing these as an entity in their own right. UX, um, I blame, I'd still blame the iPhone coming out. I think that um, when Apple released the iPhone, it totally changed the game for all software development around the end user's expectation of what, um, what they were comfortable using. So back in, um, back in the pre-iPhone days, a lot of internal applications were a fairly interesting mix of kind of grey applications with 
mediocre user interfaces. Now, people are expecting to have the same kind of level of uh, user experience in their work applications they have in their kind of home applications. So that leads us to needing to spend a lot more effort and a lot more time um, focusing on the, on the usability and the, and the user interaction within our applications than we'd ever have done before. While we're trying to release more frequently, um, that tends to lead us down a route where we're needing to monitor our applications in, in production more than ever. Um, this used to be done as a system admin thing. You'd kind of give your application over, it'd go into production, and then a whole team of admin people would kind of monitor it and make sure it worked. Now, more, of, more often, that monitoring is coming back into the development team. So we're starting to look at monitoring and the, the monitorability of your application um, as, as a key feature in the application. So we need to start testing that. Um, the final one I'm going to kind of pull, pull out is feature toggles. So we're trying to release more frequently. Um, one way to do that is, uh, so if you're releasing more frequently, we're going to end up with some functionality that's in development. If you're releasing 1,600 times a year, the chances are you're not going to have a completed piece of functionality ready every time you de deploy. So a lot of times that gets hidden behind a feature toggle. And that's great. It means it's invisible to the end user, so we can release things that are partially finished and then switch them on when they're ready. From a testing point of view, it's a bit of a nightmare because you end up with two, two applications you're testing. You're testing functionality with the feature toggle on, then testing it without the feature toggle on. And that's fine when you've got one, but what do you do when you've got 10 and they're all feature toggled on and off? So this is adds to the complexity. And this is just the stuff that we kind of know about and we're doing now. Um, what about when virtual augmented reality really starts to hit mainstream applications? What about using voice as an interface? Um, and artificial intelligence. What impact is that going to have on the way that we need to test our applications? So that's, I think that's some of the kind of challenges we have and the way that um, the software development is, is, is changing over the years. If we take a quick step back, so this is some oldish data from 2009. Um, it talks about the cost of finding defects. So um, it's a presentation that, um, from a Google um, developer, and they, they put some value on how expensive it was to find defects later in, the, later in the cycle. And it's much more expensive to find things when you need to spin up the whole testing environment. So I think this is something we all kind of naturally understand, that it's more expensive the, 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 more, the later we're finding issues. Um, but as, a, as, a, as an industry, the, the way that we're trying to address this um, is by bringing in automation. So automation is a great way to speed up how quickly we can run tests. So it allows us to take away a lot of the manual testing that we're doing and get a computer to do it, which means it's much quicker. We can parallel, parallelize it. Um, and that allows us to uh, start pushing things earlier and make them cheaper. And that helps us to support this multiple release cycle. But it's not a free lunch. Um, I think there are problems, there are challenges to automation. I think the first one is that we're really pushing testers to need to understand a lot more, um, in, a lot more things than they did before. So we've got this testing triangle. I'm sure you've seen something similar to this before. It starts talking about um, how we want to have the majority of our tests being at the kind of unit test level. Uh, so these tend to be very quick to run, they tend to be quite robust. And then you build on top of those with some more integration tests where you start to bring in different components and start getting them interacting a bit more together. Then we start looking at API and service level testing, make sure they're working correctly. And then you have a small number of tests at the, at the top, at the end to end tests where the whole system needs to be up and running. Now, this is a, a kind of a, a fairly standard approach to how we might look at building tests. But if you're trying, if you're trying to look at how um, having somebody in the testing role understanding how all of our test scenarios work and whether we've got the right coverage, whereas before when we were just really focusing on this end-to-end -end testing, that manual testing tends to be just end-to-end -end testing primarily. If you didn't really care about any of this testing here, um, 
because you're always testing things through the front end. So that we might have really good unit test coverage, but it's kind of irrelevant because we're going to test everything through the UI anyway. If we're trying to make this this end-to-end -end testing smaller, then the the tester or the, the person who is kind of overarching, kind of looking at the test, the overall test approach, needs to understand what these unit tests are doing to make sure that we we can put as few, as few tests as possible in the end-to-end -end section and still have appropriate coverage. We can push things down as much as we like, but we're still trying to, we still need to make sure that we've got an appropriate amount of test coverage. So what we're doing by kind of driving down this automation route is forcing uh, testers who quite often are not coders and not technical people to, to understand all of this inner workings of the software. And that's quite a challenge for some, for some people. But it's not just about the knowledge. Um, test code bases are starting to get big. Um, so this is some data just from a project I'm working on at the moment. It's a, it's a team of about five people. We've been working on it for about a year and a half. Um, we just counted up the number of lines of code in the application code base we've got. Um, and we categorized it into <coughs> application code and test codes. We've got end-to-end uh, -end automated tests and we've got unit integration tests. Well, we found only 30% of our, of our total code base was application code. The remaining 70% is code that tests the application code. Now, I'm not sure whether, I'm not really putting this up as a, um, as a shining beacon of what it's supposed to look like, but it's an interesting, uh, I think it's an interesting uh, thing to look at that we're starting to get, in this example, 70% of our code is test code. If we're talking about that kind of volume of code, we're starting to bring in general uh, development capability to maintain and keep that code base running. It's an application in its own right. So my uh, hypothesis right, is that modern testing requires development skills. So that's obviously not a unique thing. Um, we've known about that for a long time. I've been to quite a lot of testing conferences over the past six or so years, and this is something that the testing community is really aware of. There's been lots and lots of talks um, at conferences around kind of how is testing going to survive the, the, the modern way of working, and do testers need to be able to code? So this is the question that the testing community has been trying to answer. So I thought I wanted to look at that um, and look at what it means. Can testers become developers? If we look at what that actually kind of entails, if we look at coding skills, this is, I think, some of the things we need to think about um, if we're looking at um, bringing somebody who's not a, not a software developer into the world of building a large automated um, test application. So you're gonna to need to know probably some sort of web development of some description, HTML and CSS at least. Um, obviously, if you're not doing a web application, then there's another thing you need to learn, but a lot of the applications now are web applications. You need to have um, an understanding of automation test tools, so um, Selenium, um, Cucumber, Gherkin, that kind of thing. Um, you need to have some sort of awareness of security usually, it's a pretty complicated area. Um, as we're starting to look at author author authorization in applications, authentication is something that you need to understand. Um, more often than not now, we're going to need to pull up some um, cloud-based understanding. There's a whole bunch of different languages that you may or may not need to know. Um, you're probably going to need to know at least two. You're probably going to need to know SQL to do something in the database. You're probably going to need to know Python or some other type of language in the, in the higher levels to, to automate. And if we're talking about 70% of our code base being test code, you're going to want to understand something about software engineering, best practices, architecture. <clears throat> now, I, you don't, you're not gonna, people aren't gonna need to know this in huge amounts of detail, but there's still a huge amount of stuff that you need to learn. I think that's a big ask for um, anyone to kind of just pick that up. And testers don't necessarily, they're, they're not necessarily people who have a desire or a natural ability to be software developers. Some of them definitely will be, um, but some of them are in testing because they 
they don't want to be a software developer. So kind of forcing them to become software developers, I think is the wrong approach. <clears throat> so this got me thinking then, well, well, let's have a look at the other way around. So what about making developers testers? Um, so let's look at the same sort of things. Let's look at the traits of what a good tester are. So they bring generally a lot of domain expertise in what uh, the application is we're building. Um, they tend to have a very analytical, logical way of thinking, helps them um, kind of look into the application and work out how to uh, break it. They've got this test to break approach. Um, they actively go out to break an application and to find where it doesn't work. They're good at communicating. Um, they've got a generally a good awareness of impact on the business. So coupled in with their domain knowledge, they usually a very good spokesperson for why something is going to be a problem for the, the business. Um, and they tend to take a customer-centric view on a lot of things. Now, when I look at these things, I, I look at them, yes, they're definitely things that testers tend to bring to the, to the team. I think they're also things that good developers I've worked with also have some of these traits. So I think the, the traits, at least, are things that I think are, are things that good people in your teams have. But it's not just about these traits. There's also some kind of key sort of technical skills that, um, that testers have. They, they're very good with risk management. Uh, they've got the ability to understand how to design a, a, an approach to testing that covers the, the risks appropriately and make sure that we are, um, uh, we are finding all the issues that we're, that we, that we're finding. Um, they are very good at doing ad hoc and exploratory testing and finding interesting ways to uh, unearth defects that no one knew existed. Um, I, I'm always kind of amazed how quickly testers can find issues after they've been through an entire kind of developer testing session. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> um, they understand black and white box testing, capacity and load testing generally, and usability testing. These are all kind of things that, that they uh, bring to the, to the team as a, a, set of, a set of skills. <coughs> so, I look at those and I'm still thinking, well, they are things that are kind of good. I think if you could, if as a developer, you were better at all these things, I think then that you're a better developer. So given that I think these are things that are good skills for a developer to be better at, we set about looking at how can we help the team get better at testing. So what I've been trying to do is look at uh, can we replace testers completely by making developers better at testing? Which is a controversial topic, a controversial option. But I've come up with a th three, three steps to how I think we can do this. So I think the first one is, the first thing we need to do is improve just the developer's awareness of what we're doing, what the tests are that we've got. You tend to have Developers have got a pretty good idea of what the unit tests are in an application. They've got sometimes a reasonable idea of integration tests, but then as soon as it gets into kind of past that, they tend to not have any idea what testing is going on. And that's something that, that is often just in the testing kind of remit. So we need to get developers better at understanding what we're doing, what testing is there. Um, we then need to get, I think, testers better at understanding some of the development side. I'm not looking at making testers into developers, but I think having an awareness of um, what's involved in, in writing the code and what's involved and what things are likely to be a problem, which ones aren't, helps uh, build better tests. And I think once we've got developers a bit more aware of what's happening with the tests, we can then start getting into a little bit more understanding of what's going on with exploratory testing, like how do they do that properly? Developers are already doing testing. They're just doing it badly, generally. Um, and once you get to there, I think then we can kind of really up the ante and get developers doing exploratory testing properly. Um, and I think it's that point then we can really start driving down 
an automated testing pipeline. I don't think we can do that fully beforehand. So let's go into these in a little bit more detail. So first step. This is kind of the easiest bit, I think. What we're trying to do here is get the developers and testers having a proper conversation at the start of work and understanding what the scenarios are. I, want, I kind of want the developers to know before they start writing anything how we're going to measure that it's working well. It's like I want them to know how their work is going to be kind of assessed at the end. And the hope is that if they know that, a lot of issues that we're going to find will disappear because they'll have thought about them and they'll make them so that it's impossible for the application to do that. But it's obviously it's not going to be a foolproof way of doing it. So we then, the, the tester works with developers to understand what the scenarios are, they agree what the scenarios are, and then we get the development team to actually write all the automated tests for those scenarios. And we free up all of the testing time then to spend on doing the exploratory testing that we really need humans to be doing to actually find bugs. And we get the developers implementing the tests. This way, develop, the developers and the team really start to understand what the tests are covering. We leverage their uh, software engineering skills in order to build this huge code base of automated testing. Um, and they start to understand a bit more about what's going on in the test. And we're still using testers for the, the complicated bits that really need the testing skill set of um, understanding what scenarios we need to be covering and actually trying to break the application. So once we get to this point, I think we're kind of ready then to move on to the second step in the process. And this is really all about pairing. Um, there's two sides to it. I think we have developers and testers pairing to uh, get the testers better at writing the automated tests, so we can start sharing that knowledge around. Um, and we have the developers and testers pairing to do exploratory testing, so that the developers start to get better at doing exploratory testing. Um, once we get to this point, this part, we're starting to get to the point where the testers think of the developers as competent enough testers. Like, we're trying to get to the point where the testers are considering the developers as testers when they're doing testing, rather than it's just a developer executing some tests, because that, that's never really a great situation to be in when they're thinking of developers as running tests, because they just tend to do a terrible job of it. Um, so then we've got testers at this point able to focus on other things, so other testing things that we that tend to get kind of left to the last minute. So we could start focusing on um, more complex type of, uh, of testing that we might need to kind of bring up a bit more, uh, a bit more time and a bit more understanding on. Um, we could start getting to focus more on some of the usability of the application. Uh, if they want to, then at that point we can start getting them to focus more on coding, if that's the area that they, they are interested in doing. It really depends at this point what the individuals in your team are interested in doing. And we move to the final step where we actually kind of move testers out of the team um, and we start having developers being a tester on that, in that sprint of iteration. Uh, I've stolen kind of the Atlassian uh, term. They, they call it dotting, developer on test. They have a developer and they, they are responsible for doing all the testing, the same way that you would if you were a tester. It just happens to be a developer, a, an ex-developer doing that. And they can cycle that around through the team. Um, at this point, you've still got testers here who are checking and making sure that the, the, developer, the developers are doing the right job. Um, so, they're spending a lot of more time mentoring the developers to make them into uh, testers. And we're, we're spending time kind of feeding back and reviewing what the different team, what the, what the, what the tests are. Are there things that we could have been missing? Reviewing back the defects that have actually been found in production. Uh, is that because we've missed an area in our testing? Um, and then at that point, I think then 
the development team has got a really detailed insight into all of that testing triangle from the unit test all the way up to the end-to-end -end test. And we can then start having a really good conversation about how is it best to automate some of this work. And we can start really moving towards an automated, fully automated pipeline. So that's my three-step uh, approach to re replacing testers with developers. Um, it's not perfect. There are a few of obvious questions that might come up with this. So kind of what happens to the testing role in this new world I'm talking about? So I think there's two kind of key options. So I think for me, instead of thinking of the testing role more like a, developing, a developer role, I think we should think of the tester role more like a Scrum Master role. So if you look at Scrum Master, um, they're there to help support the team and um, make sure they're working as effectively as possible. Now, if you're a good Scrum Master and you get your team working really well, the amount of day-to-day -day input you need to have with each of your teams gets smaller, so you can then start to share your love around to other teams. I think that the testing role, we should start thinking about it more like that. So the, the role of the tester in this, uh, I propose, is that they are there to help the developers get better at testing. And then as they get to the point where your developers are all good testers, then they can start stepping away and they're going to help the next team. Um, it's not just, um, that's not the only option. I think there's a second option where the, the testing role becomes much more of a consulting kind of role where they have really specific skills um, that we need to bring into the team to help um, a particular area. We might have a, an application that's really complex to do performance testing on. We'll bring in a performance testing Uber consultant. They can come in and help. So that's the role. Um, what about the actual people themselves? Um, I think it really depends on the individual we're talking about. I think if you look at testing as testers, just a broad kind of bucket of people, they've all got different skills and interests. And some of them will have a skill or an interest and an aptitude to be a software developer. I think they can quite easily move into software development. Um, if you look at the kind of generalised skills that testing testers tend to bring to a team, we've also got a lot of uh, domain knowledge and understanding of how the application can build together and risk. So I think a product manager, product owner kind of role is a natural fit for some testers. We've also got, um, a, they're building up this kind of mentoring um, process driven kind of approach. So Scrum Master is a pretty good fit. Um, and then other people might find that they have an interest in usability, say UX designer maybe. So I think there's a, a role change. Um, or there's a speci specialism route to go down. Um, this, this kind of world I'm, uh, I'm painting isn't something that we're gonna is going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over a really long time. And developers aren't going to become uh, capable testers in doing everything all at the same time. So there's definitely routes here where you can have specialization and um, come in as more of an expert. The other question I think is what, why would the developers want to do this? It kind of sounds a bit like a nightmare, just getting an extra load of work thrown at you. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Play testers. <laughs> Is it something I said? <laughs> okay, what's the difference? I think there's three things that take it for developers. Because um, I think developers are already doing testing, and yeah, sure, if you speak to them, probably a lot of them don't like it, but they still do it. I think the one thing they do hate more than testing is fixing defects. Um, so I think there's less bug fixing. I think if you can understand a bit more and you think about a bit more about what problems there's going to be in the code before you start writing it, you tend to naturally find there's less bugs. I think you get better quality code. Um, so I think if you start building your application to be more testable, then it becomes more maintainable. So it's easier to work on that code base. 
Now, we see that with TDD. TDD tends to be quite a good way of creating quite maintainable code that's easy to test. But if you start looking at it from the, the whole of the testing of triangle, we're starting to not, not just look at unit testing, but also all of the testing. It starts to become much more uh, easy to understand what's going on in the code base. So I think you get better, better code. Um, and I think you get more autonomy as a set of developers. There's lots of times when developer, uh, you have a developer and a testing conversation about where's the right place to do these tests. So the, you find that the testers don't really understand what's going on at the unit test level. So it's difficult to explain why it's not important to do that end-to-end -end test. And the fact they tend to listen about what the end-to-end -end tests are. So you end up with this kind of conversation where it's quite awkward to get both sides of the argument. If you've got much better understanding of all of that, um, then you start to have the right conversations about how, where's the most appropriate place to do this testing. So, second thing, does it work? Um, that's a, the, the million dollar question. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, Forrester Research, in 2011, there was a guy, one of the VPs of Forrester Research, uh, put a blog post out with a catchy title of uh, something like, do you want to improve your software quality, then fire your QA team. Um, and he was talking about one of his clients, they're a, um, a finance company, real-time financial data for the finance sector, got rid of their entire testing team, and they found that quality went up. He didn't say by how much or how they measured it, but he did say that it went up. Um, we look at Facebook in 2011, um, they, there was a, there's a few articles that came out um, where there was a, a quote from an ex-developer or an ex-engineering lead at Facebook. And they said that Facebook had no employees who were dedicated to QA or otherwise performed QA as their primary job responsibility. Well, whether we think that Facebook's got good quality or not, I think it's a different question. Um, Yahoo, in 2015, they have rolled out their warp drive program, an internal program that looked to do more continuous delivery and started to allow um, their engineering team, their individual developers, to be able to push changes into production without any um, approval or sign off from anybody other than the developers themselves. Um, and then we've got Atlassian. Now, they've been kind of the thought leaders and um, for how, how to test differently. And they've got a whole bunch of articles for the past 10 years around how they, how they work in, um, with QA and, and, and development. Um, they had an interesting um, article a few, a few years ago where they were talking about the JIRA development team. And it was something like 60 software developers and they had three QA people. Um, and their head of QA decided to describe their um, when, when she was asked about why they could get away with having so few testers, she said that she didn't think she had so few testers because she felt like she had 63 um, software testers because she thought that the software, the developers were good enough to be testers in any other company. So there's loads of interesting articles on uh, Atlassian um, talking about how they go through this. They've got a bit more of a kind of process than, than I've described. Um, so, what about head forwards and what have we been doing? So, we're pretty much stuck at this step at the moment. We've had really great success getting the developers in implementing automated tests um, and getting the, the conversation between development and testing to be uh, understanding how we're going to test things and where the risk is. And we've also had pretty good success getting the developers pairing with the testers to do automation testing. So we've decided to build up some of that knowledge. Um, we're kind of struggling at the moment to do this testing, test of pairs with developer to do exploratory testing. Um, but not for the reason I thought. I thought there'd be a lot of pushback from the developers to kind of be doing this exploratory testing. But the developers are really quite keen on doing that. They're, they're, they're quite open to the idea of doing better testing. Um, I think we've kind of broken them by doing all this automation testing. Um, the big stumbling point at the moment is with the testers and the testing guys. Um, I think that I've done a really bad job with them of explaining why they're not going to just be made unemployed by this role. And they're really kind of conscious that if 
they get the developers doing all the stuff they're doing, what are they going to be left to do? Um, so that's a totally valid concern. I can see that. Um, and I've yet to find a really great way to put their minds at rest. I have no intention of, of really reducing the number of people we've got. So I'm at the moment stuck at step two. So my step three is somewhat um, theoretical at the moment. So let's just quickly kind of summarise. I think, I think that developers are capable of becoming pretty effective testers. Um, they are um, in a good position for a lot of the types of testing we're doing now. Uh, we're becoming more and more driven around automation testing, which is writing code. So it's only a small step, really, to change the kind of type of code they're writing. So they're, they're quite capable of doing this. Um, they just need to be trained and, and supported to do that. Um, but we do need to be quite conscious of the impact of this change to our testing community as well as the developers. Um, so the testers are clearly, in my organisation, concerned that they'll become irrelevant and lose their job, which um, is, a, is a, something we need to be conscious of. Um, and I think the reason we're trying to do this is to move, um, I think moving away from having dedicated testers allows us to scale better. Um, if you look at growing a team, we need, to, we need to employ software developers to create something. Um, if we want to start increasing our size of our teams to better deliver more, more functionality, that's directly related to the number of developers we can recruit. If we have to also recruit um, a percentage of testers or any other uh, supporting role to help that, that makes your recruitment more complicated. If we could just recruit more developers, we'd be able to scale more linearly. That is my, that is my goal um, and what I'm trying to get to. But it's a journey that I'm still part way through. That is everything I've got. I'm happy to answer any of your questions that you might have. Yes. So, uh, I'm a developer and I don't like the idea of not having access to a tester brain. Um, <laughs> because it seems to me a bit like um, maybe, like an analogy would be if um, you're in a criminal trial, say, which um, would be maybe a bit of an antagonistic word, but you've got your uh, lawyer for the defence and your lawyer for the prosecution. Now, the lawyer for the defence could be a lawyer for the prosecution or vice versa, but each of them have their own responsibilities and their own things that are. Um, you know, their own areas of what, what's their duty and what sort of perspective they're supposed to take. So I spend a lot of time thinking very hard about um, trying to think like a computer mm -hmm. and really getting into the depths of like what's going on in the JVM, what exceptions can be thrown here. And then uh, it sort of frees them up a little bit not to have to think like a human. So you've got, then you've got your tester who's thinking like a human, like sort of, but you've, you've been thinking so hard about exceptions, you've totally forgotten that a human being would do this. Mm -hmm. So... That, for me, seems like uh, if I was trying to be the tester as well, I would have to sort of really pull out... I don't think I could be both at the same time. It'd be a bit... I, yeah. I, 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 I think you're right. I don't think yeah. you can be both at exactly the same time. But I think if you can think a bit like a human as well, like at some point when you're starting to work out how... Um, before you fall into the kind of mm -hmm. middle of the GBM, um, then that starts you thinking down um, a, a path where you're going to end up with a better solution. I think if you wait until another person looks at it, then you end up delaying the point where you're going to find there's a problem, if you can I, kind of get that earlier. Yeah, I totally agree with your stage too, and I think we're sort of doing that because we start, um, uh, we try to start every bit of work we do by talking between mm -hmm. the two. Um, so you, like you say, define from the start what you're trying to, well, how you're going to tell if something works and what the test would be. So, and that works really well. But it would still make me um, a bit stressed if I didn't feel like there was somebody else who was, having the, ab who was the advocate for another, another sort of thinking, because I just get into a tunnel and you know, I'm looking really deeply. So mm -hmm. that's, that was my, yeah. That's not to say that you couldn't be another developer if you wasn't involved in that bit of code. Though. Yeah, but they might still get di distracted by the exceptions. <laughs> but then they, they might not necessarily look at the code. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. No, I agree, it's about upskilling, isn't it? And uh, about getting the developer to think about the final product mm -hmm. and then build that into the capsule. The way I look at it is 
Developers are currently spending quite a lot of their time doing testing of some description. They're dev testing, they're, they are clicking through the application and doing stuff. Um, but then we give it to a tester and they, they do basically the same thing, they click through the application and they just click through it differently and they find loads of stuff. So what we're saying, the, the, the effort that the developers are spending doing dev testing now is just not very effective. If we could get them even better at just doing more effective dev testing, then that's a bit of a win, I think, for the whole team. Just to extend that analogy, I mean, I think I think the judge, is, you know, the the, the, the prosecution, the defence—that's the sort of final test of of the, whether or not the software passes or it's good enough. Does it do the job or not? And that's like putting it out of the business and putting it into production. Um, is you know, you you will find out whether or not it passes or fails. The CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, who normally bring cases to court, should, if they're doing their job effectively, actually be able to make sure something is good enough, or you know that they shouldn't be bringing cases forward that are not good enough to to you know go to go to trial, or you know they they should be preparing the, the right cases so that you know they they do successfully go through because otherwise it's a complete waste of time and money so actually it's about making sure and and in order to get that right they've got to understand both sides of the the coin no more analogies around that one <laughs> <laughs> does feel a little bit like we're in a courtroom <laughs> any other questions no all right okay. cool Thank you very much, everyone.